Look at me at James chapter 4, verse 8. We've been quoting this verse the last three weeks or two. This will be three. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Let's say it together. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Say it again. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Now, we're going to say it one more time. And if you need Him to come to you, I want you to say this like you mean it. Let's do it. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. You know there's power in that. You just say it, but think about what you're speaking. That means as I draw into God, He doesn't stand away. He comes the other step to me and to you. Let me pray with you before you see that. God, today as we've encountered your presence and encountered your love, we thank you that you brought us out of a pit. You brought us out of destruction. You brought us far out of what we used to be. We thank you that we're a work in progress, that we're not a finished product, and that you didn't just save us and say that's it, but you've called us to a calling, you have a purpose and destiny for us, and I pray, God, that we would encounter you in a way that would change our perspective today. Give us what we need today, God. Not just an experience. I'm not praying for an experience. I'm not praying for goosebumps. I'm not just praying for a good shout or just a good feeling. I'm praying for an encounter that digs deep. Something that scrapes away the, the junk. Something that, that moves away the issues. And that you're high and lifted up in our life today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Turn to somebody, welcome them to church today. Tell them you're glad to see them. Tell them how good they look. They want to hear that. Tell them, tell them how good they look. Tell them you look good. You look good. Now, now if you can't say that with a clean heart and a pure heart, then say it anyway and lie. No, I'm just kidding. Don't lie. Don't lie in church. Amen. Hey, it's good to see you today. Are you glad to be at church? Are you glad to be here today? I hope you've had a good week this week. I finally finished out. I've been sharing you my dental stories, and I finally finished out another dental week of having two teeth pulled. It was, it was a mighty great time in the dentist's office that we had. I about had revival when they said it was done, and then they took all my money. I don't understand. Can I share that? I don't understand how I can go through that and still have to pay them. How is that worth my money? You're going to pull my teeth out of my head. I'm going to bleed everywhere and have to gun jello for two days and mash potatoes. Thank you, honey, for making me mash potatoes. And I've got to pay you for that? Something's wrong. Something's wrong. They should pay me for doing that. Taking my teeth out of my head. You can't grow them things back. You know? There's something missing now on this side of the on this side of the mouth. Hey, it's good to see you today. Good to see you today. It's okay to smile. Don't look too serious. What's y'all serious for? Some of you smile, we're great, and you get in church, and you're like, in the road, you're going right down there in the car, and you're going, oh, <laughs> this is great, and you're laughing, and, you're, and then you get in church, it's like, mm. what's the matter with y'all? You ain't got the joy of the Lord? Remember, joy is different than happiness. You don't have to be happy, but you need the joy of the Lord. Amen. Well, we're finishing out our series called Close Encounters. I hope this has blessed you as much as just blessed me studying it. And I've enjoyed studying the Word and, and getting these messages together, what God has given me. And that's been our theme, come near to God. He will come near to you. If you'll draw to Him, He'll draw to you. And sometimes I feel like God can be far away from me. Sometimes I pray and, and I feel that God is, you know, 10 miles away from my prayer. 
And, and, and I don't know if you've ever felt that way before, but, but sometimes I've prayed and felt like it just hit the ceiling and come back down in my room. I've, I've prayed before and said, God, I need you to meet a need. I need you to give me an answer. I need you to give me wisdom. I need you to give me guidance. I need to feel your presence. I, I need you to, to, to show me something in my life. And I feel like it just went up and come back down and just didn't, didn't go anywhere. Anybody ever felt that way before? Am I the only one? I felt that way so much. Sometimes I started saying, God, are you even around when I pray? I mean, are you even here? Do you even know what my name is anymore? I, I need to know that you are are near to me. But 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 I wanted to assure you that a feeling isn't always the indication that God is near. Sometimes you're never going to feel anything, but God doesn't want you to have to trust a feeling. He just wants you to trust Him in general. Yeah. So an encounter with Him isn't always what you feel. It can be nothing that you feel at all, and it can be all about your faith. Sometimes God wants to, to strengthen your faith. But I, I did want to remind you that the Holy Spirit's always where you are. And so wherever you're at, there's the Spirit. If you're in your car, the Spirit's there. If you're in this church, the Spirit's there. If you're in your home, the Spirit's there. If you're at your job, the Spirit's there. Have you ever thought when you're at your job and you're having a bad day and a bad week, and, and have you ever thought that you're not the only one sitting there with you, that if you're sitting at your desk or walking and doing your job, that the Holy Spirit's walking right where you are, that everywhere you are, He is, and, and that He sees everything you're facing. And, and just because you're in a circumstance doesn't mean you're in it alone. He's with you in the circumstance. He's with you in the battle. I am a little bit happy about that today. I hope that you get a little bit more happy with me as I'm talking about an encounter with God. I don't, I don't like to, to preach to the church first, the first church of the frigid air. So, last time I checked, we're Pentecostal. We believe in the Spirit moving in our church and saying amen and hallelujah. And I like it anyway. Give the Lord a hand for who He is today. Come on. I don't want to be here and looking at you and you looking at me and let's go home looking at each other. I want us to have an encounter with God. My goal is that you encounter God in a different way, a new way, something different, something brand new. That's been my prayer for you. It's that you will get closer to God. And I want to tell you something great. The closer you get to God, the more you start looking like God. I've heard that if you're married for a while, the longer you're married to someone, to your spouse, you start looking like them. I've heard that. I don't know that that's true, but I've heard that. I actually, someone said that Melissa and I thought, thought they thought we were brother and sister. And I said, no, let me, I don't do that. You know, I'm not, we're not, mm -mm, we're not swinging like that. You know, we, we, we've known each other for a while, but uh, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. And I thought about, you know, the more you're around somebody, the more you kind of talk like them and act like them and laugh like them and, 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 and you kind of develop their habits or they'll develop yours. So, so one, one, one thing's going to happen. The longer you're around somebody, either you're going to become a little bit like them or they're going to become a little bit like you. So you're either going to develop a, a good habit from somebody. For example, if, if, if somebody, uh, um, you know, tells good jokes, maybe you can... Learn some good jokes from them. Maybe you'll rub off. Maybe they'll rub off on you in some good ways. Or, or maybe if someone's really spiritual, that they'll kind of lead you in the right direction spiritually. It's good to hang out with people who are always um, and take this right way dumber than you are. <laughs> some people like to hang around people that are just below them. I like to hang around people that are above me that know more than I do. And, and it's not many people, but I, I'm just kidding. I'm just picking. Don't 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 take me too seriously. I like to hang around people who lift lift me up, don't you? Don't you like to be around an encourager? Don't you like to be around people who lift you up? So over time, as you're around somebody, you'll kind of develop their traits. Melissa developed something for me. She can say she did, but I know she did because when we first got married, she didn't know how to do something that's very, very great. It's called taking a bowl, taking six Oreos or seven, whichever pulls out first, and putting the Oreos in a bowl and then pouring milk on them. And it's called Oreo cereal. She'd never done that before. I taught her something very important in life. Very important in life. And she's learned. And since she's been pregnant, she's really enjoyed this thing in which I've taught her. And so has my daughter, who is to come in the next few days. Pray for me. Pray for me. <laughs> Oh, and pray for Melissa, too. 
But really, I need you to... Yeah, yeah, but really pray for us. Yes, help me. But I, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. Because that means if I get really close to God, I'm not going to rub off on God. You understand that, right? You're not going to rub off on God because we're none of us perfect. But the closer I get to God, the other way can happen and He can rub off on me. So the more I get close to God and the more I desire His presence and the more I pray and the longer I seek Him and, and I get in the, I just get in my war room or my prayer closet like we were talking last week, then that's when I can have an encounter with Him and He can fill me with some things that I didn't have before I got in there. And so the closer I get to Him, the closer He gets to me, and the more I get closer to Him, I start looking like Him. I start thinking like He thinks. And, and I start I start dealing with situations like He wants me to deal with them. But, but watch it. But if I entertain the other part, which would be the flesh, which would be the enemy, then I start handling things the way the enemy would and not the way he would. I have to be close to what I want to be a, a resemblance of. If I want to look like God, then I need to get close to God. If I want to, if I want to act like God, then I need to be close to God so He can teach me how to act. Every time God encounters someone in the Bible, every time there's three things that happen. These are the three things I'm going to tell you about today. So if you're taking notes, these are the three things I need you to put down. If you're a note taker, you'll like all three. Number one of the three, He touches them, or He reveals Himself to them. I'm sorry, He reveals Himself to them. The second thing is He touches them. And the third thing is He uses them. So, He reveals Himself, He touches, and then He uses. But He's not going to use you in the way you want to be used until He can touch you first. And for Him to touch you like He wants to touch you, He's got to reveal Himself to you. There's some things that's going to take place. I want to show you how this exactly happens. The purpose of an encounter is not just to have an encounter with God. Oh, I just want an encounter with God. If you truly want an encounter with God, then you know after you're done having an encounter with Him, you're going to be on a mission to do something with that encounter. You don't just have an encounter. Because let me tell you the difference. If you want a real encounter with God, then what you've encountered, you actually go out and use. If you just want an experience, then you just want a feeling, and you don't ever want to do anything with what you felt. That's the difference in an encounter and experience. And so I want, I want to show you something. Uh, right quick in the Old Testament. There was a king named Uzziah. And I don't know if you've heard about Uzziah. He, he was a good king at first. He started off good. He, he, he had a good reputation. He was doing things like he should have done. But then toward the end of his regime, he started becoming really prideful. And, and he started being hard-headed. And he, and he started doing stupid things. And, and then he started kind of going against God. And then he went totally against God. Next thing you know, God strikes him with leprosy. He got, he got struck with leprosy. And, and so, and then he passed away, and, and Israel's in the middle of a crisis. They're in chaos. They're, they're looking around. They're going, what are we going to do? Uzziah's gone, and, 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 and what's next? And, and so all of a sudden, this guy named Isaiah, Isaiah had an encounter with God. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. High and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. The two wings they covered him, or covered their faces. With the two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Now that's a sight. Think about it. And they were calling to one another. So the whole time they're flying and covering themselves, and they're around God the Father, they're saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Let me paint a, a picture for you, if I can get a little bit you know, deeper in, in the thought. Isaiah's in chaos as well. Isaiah sees... God high and lifted up in his train. What does that what does the train mean? Well, that's the back part of a road. So if, you know, like uh, I'll give you a good example, uh, a wedding gown. If you think about a wedding gown, and, and when the bride comes in, most of the time their wedding gowns dragging behind them and, and gentlemen they get up here, the 
the, the, uh, one of the bridesmaids will grab the bottom of the gown, the train part of it, which is what drags behind. And they'll pick it up, and she'll walk up here, and, and the train will still be kind of off to the side or something like that. Well, Isaiah said when he saw God, he saw, he saw him walking through the temple, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He began to see God high and lifted up, and as he was, the train filled the temple. Now, filled means to me that, that it wasn't just a little train. It was a big train. It, 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 was, it was something that filled the temple. It was, if he walked from this aisle and back around, I think it just kind of curved all the way around. That way, that way, whoever was in the temple felt the presence because the train was filling the temple. Okay? And, all the, and, and then Isaiah kept looking, and there were seraphims flying around. I don't know if they, you know, looked like little cupids or what you would say. You know, I, I don't know what they, what, what they would look like, but, but, but little seraphims are flying around, and, and, and they've, they've got all these wings, and, and wings are covering their face and covering their feet, and then other wings are, are, are flapping like this, and they're, and they're crying out as they're going around. They're saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they keep saying, Holy, holy, and they're looking at each other, and, look, and they can't look at God. They're just going, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, and, and they just keep going on and on and on and on and on. And this went on, and Isaiah's watching this. You might would say that Isaiah had God reveal himself to him. You see that? Does that make sense? I know Alex got it. Does that make sense to everybody else? Do you get that? Do you understand that when, when God revealed himself to Isaiah, Isaiah was looking on like, you've got to be kidding me. I can't believe what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the, the train of, of God fill the temple. I'm feeling the presence of God all around. I, and I'm looking at seraphims, and they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And God is, an, is revealing Himself to me. It's an encounter that's getting ready to take place. Have you ever, have you ever been in, in a service, a bit of the church? Or have you ever been in a revival or... Have you ever been at your house or whatever? And, and you feel like, you really, truly feel like that the presence of God filled the place in which you were at. Have, have, you, ever, have, have you ever had an, an encounter that, that, that I'm, not, I'm not, and I'm not downing goosebumps. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's not the presence of God. I'm not, I'm not telling you that. But, but what I'm wanting to, to get deep in your system and in, in your mind and your heart is, is that I'm not just craving a goosebump experience. Okay? I want a feeling of the Spirit of God that empowers me to do something greater than I can do on my own. But we're never going to get that way if, if we become too impatient to seek God in our life. A prayer to God should not be a 60-second prayer that you pray when you get home or when you're laying in the bed and you pray for a minute and a half as you fall asleep. Start earlier. It's okay to pray in the bed, but start when you're awake. If you want to pray until you go to sleep, that's fine, but give God more than a minute and a half to talk to Him. I, I, we talked a little bit about that last week, but why is it that we get impatient with God when we want to talk to Him, but yet we want Him to do something quick for us we want God to do something great for us. We want God to give us an encounter that changes our life. But yet we say, God, you've got 60 seconds to do it in. How does that work? How, how do you expect God to do what you're wanting to do if you don't give Him time to do it? Yeah? It, we can't have an encounter with God that we're wanting to rush. I think that when you get in the presence of God, time stands still. If you have a true encounter with God, you're not worried about what the clock says. I don't know what time it is, or I hear the tell. You're not worried when you get in the presence of God. If you come down to this altar and you kneel and you get in the presence of God, you're not worried about who's on either side of you. You're not worried about who's touching you on the head. You're not worried about who's coming down to the altar, or if the music keeps playing, or if I'm up here running my mouth. You're not worried about that. All you're worried about is what you're in the presence of. And when you're in the presence of God, you're not worried about nothing else because it's an encounter that has come down on you. You. There's a difference in an experience and encounter, and, and, and we need to be seeking God so that He gives us an encounter. I'm convinced that the key in our relationship with God is to be close to Him. I, I, I believe that's a key, but there has to be, you, you can want to be close to God, but are you doing what it takes to be close to God? You, know, you, you can, it's kind of like, you know, 
If you want to get out of debt, then you'll do what it takes to get out of debt. You know, I want to get out of debt. Well, where'd you go eat last night? Oh, oh the Texas Roadhouse. I had to have that filet. Well, that was twenty dollars you could have put on your credit card. <laughs> you know, why? Why is it that what we want, we we desire God, but we don't want to do what it takes to get God? We want God to do something great in our life, but yet we don't want to pray and fast. Some things only come, as Jesus says, through prayer and fasting. You're not going to get it any other way. You can you, look. You can pray all you want to, but sometimes it's going to take the fast. And you're going to have to fast. And I'm not talking about fasting just because you're not hungry. That doesn't count. Fasting means you sacrifice something to get something. You empty something out so God can fill it back up. I'm preaching better than you're amen in me. I remember when I was on a youth retreat. Uh, one time when I was 14, and uh, believe it or not, my dad was my youth pastor. Oh, yeah. That was great. Can't get away with nothing. <laughs> you know? And I'm always the one getting picked on in the class. Come on, person. Let me use you as an example. Oh, great. Here we go again. What's it going to be this time? Well, we're on a youth retreat, and we're up in the mountains at a cabin. And I remember um, it was. It seemed like it was in the middle of nowhere. It probably was. It probably wasn't a few miles from really everything, but it was just one of those places that felt like you're kind of deserted and nothing else is around you. And, and at nighttime, there wasn't any lights except at the cabin, so it was pitch black. You know, you can't see anything. And as as we're all sitting around, I remember my dad saying, um, "This time we're going to begin our service." And we had a guy on the guitar, and he was over there playing. And I think he was playing a song. Uh, called Surround Me, O Lord, and I think Clint Brown wrote it. Um, it, said, uh, it said something like, um, Surround me, O Lord, surround me, O Lord, and let your presence fill this place. And they just sang it. We to sing it. And finally, the guy on the guitar just quit playing, put his guitar down, and quit singing all together, and he fell on his face. Well, Everybody's kind of looking around, and I look for my dad, and he's on his face. And I look at my mom, and she's on her face. And I looked at some of our other youth leaders, and they're on their face. And I start thinking, what's going on? What's going on is that God is filling the place. And so we just begin to keep singing. I remember the youth that weren't on their face were, were singing, and, and I remember that, that as I began to sing this song and tears began to fall down my cheeks and, and went down, and, and I began to, to feel something I've never felt before. It wasn't goosebumps. It was like an feeling of the presence of God so strong that I can't explain it. See, when you have an encounter with God, it's unexplainable. You can't explain God's power. You can't, if you can explain it, it wasn't an encounter. It might have been an experience, but it wasn't an encounter. But when you can't explain it, you know it was something real. It was something that God did because He's unexplainable. You can't explain God. And as I began to praise Him, I just fell out of my face just like everybody else. And, and everybody just began to fall down. And, and before too long, there wasn't any mu more music. There wasn't any more surround me, O oh Lord, because He had already surrounded us. And so He was already in the midst. And, 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 and I, I looked up and, and I started looking around. And every person, we had about 35 youth on the trip. And every person I looked at, everybody was on their face before God. And it was like a hush come over that place in that cabin. All you could hear was out of that come four or five pastors, teachers, people who are serving in churches, people who are, are, are business owners that are giving heavily to the churches and supporting funds. What am I saying? When you have an encounter with God, it changes who you become. You're no longer the same person that you used to be. And God wants to reveal Himself in a way that changes us inside out. We say, well, look how that person dresses or acts. Well, that's true. If they have a true encounter with God, let it start on the inside. It'll come on the outside. You can't start on the outside. You start on the inside. When I went to God, He didn't look at what I was wearing. He looked at my heart condition first. When you went to God, He didn't say... 
put on some different clothes. He said, let me, let me give you a heart transplant first, and then we'll worry about the clothes. See, an encounter with God doesn't start on the outside. Well, I don't, I don't like how they act. Or I don't like what they say. And I don't like this. And we begin to judge on the outward appearance. But God says, I don't judge on the outward. I judge on the inward. And that's what we need to pray that God changes. It's the inward, not the outward. That's the encounter. That's the encounter. So look at this. I've got to keep going. So Isaiah 6, 4 through 7. So he's already been, God's revealed himself to Isaiah. Let me show you the second part where he touched him. At the sounds of the voices, of the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And Isaiah said, Woe to me! I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The one, the seraphim, flew to me with a live coal, in his hand, which he taken, which he taken with the tongs from the altar, with it he touched my mouth and said, "See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away, and your sin atoned for." So Isaiah sees God, but God doesn't leave him unclean, because when God reveals Himself to you, what's the first thing? What's the first thing Isaiah did? When he saw God high and lifted up, what, is, what was his first words? Woe unto me, I'm ruined. Because what? When you see how big God is, truly, then you realize how small you really are. When you see how powerful God is and how awesome He truly is, it makes you begin to realize how unpowerful you truly are and how much you need Him in your life. And he will, he will give you that encounter. He'll give you, He'll reveal Himself to you in that way. And, and you're going to feel like Isaiah. And I feel like Isaiah quite a bit. I'll, I'll be in the presence of God and I'll just say, I don't deserve your presence, God. I don't deserve to feel you like this. I, I don't deserve to, to, to know you like I know. I don't deserve to have this hunger and passion for you. I don't deserve this. You know why? Because we don't deserve God. We don't deserve grace. We don't deserve mercy. We don't deserve anything He ever gives us. You say, well, I'm a pretty good person. But you don't deserve what He gives you. you you don't deserve the, the sacrifice that Jesus paid for you. And I don't either. Nobody does. No preacher on TV. No big television evangelist. Nobody you think is the most anointed person. Nobody nobody deserves the anointing of God. Nobody deserves His power. Nobody deserves His grace. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't do anything to get it. He just freely gave it to us because of His love. He gave that to you because of love. And He looked at Isaiah and He said, Isaiah, I know you feel like woe is you. And you are. You are ruined. You're not a good man. And the seraphim come down and put a coal off the altar and said, but I'm going to make you clean. I'm going to give you something brand new. And he touched his lips. And he made him clean. Did I say he deserved that? He didn't deserve it. But God gave it anyway. He revealed himself. And then he touched Isaiah. He touched Sometimes when we get in the presence of God, we, we tend to look at ourselves, I guess, more than we should. And what I mean by that is, let me give you an example. We'll come to God and we spend the entire time we're talking to God, to God bashing ourselves. I've done this. I get on my knees and I'll pray and I'll go to my basement at home. And I'll get on my knees, and I'll just begin to pray to God, and, and I'll just begin to bash myself. God, I'm not worthy. God, I, you know, and I spend five minutes bashing who I am. Now, granted, I shouldn't be uplifting myself because I've done nothing to deserve that. But at the same regard, if all I do is look at myself how Satan sees me, and not how God sees me, See, there's a big difference. Because how God sees me is completely different than how Satan sees me. See, Satan will call out my sins. Satan will call out what I used to be and where I used to go and what I used to do. Satan will call out the person I used to be. But God calls out the person he wants me to be. He says, I want to show you what I want you to do. I want to show you what I want you to be. I want to show you where I brought you from. See, if, if anything happens to you and it calls out your past, it's not God. God will never call out your past. 
What God wants to do is speak to who you are and who He wants you to become. And so when you get an encounter with God and you begin to, to see God revealing Himself to you, and you begin to, to, to have that encounter with Him that begins to change, you understand you're going to be under attack or Satan's going to try to remind you of where He where He used to have you in bondage and, and where He had you trapped and, and where He had you where you couldn't get out. But God's going to say, but I broke the chains of that bondage. I took that on my back when, when I healed you from, from that I, the, that addiction you had. I healed you from that. I delivered you from that. When I rose on the grave on the third day, I broke the chains of bondage. I took the keys of death fell on the grave. So there's a difference. Listen to the voices that talk to you. You don't have to listen to the accuser. Listen to the one who took the sacrifice for you. Listen to your, what I call your lawyer. <laughs> listen to the one that's justice. Don't listen to the accuser. Isaiah looked and he said, "He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, what this literally would, would, te- would tell you is, if you, if you literally take it from what it's saying, it said, Isaiah is saying, I'm a man that had unclean lips. Basically, I've, had, I've got a problem with my language. He said, I've got unclean lips. He didn't talk about his hands. Talk about his feet. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. When you go to God, name what your problem is. Yeah? If you know you've got a problem with lust, go to God and say, I have a problem with lust and I need your forgiveness. I need your deliverance. If you have a problem with with envy or pride or bitterness, then go to Him and say, I have a problem with this. And let Him take it from you the only way that He can. Let Him do what what He's supposed to do with you. But but, I've got to show you something else right quick. Now, don't lose me because I've got got one other thing I've got to tell you about this particular passage in this story. But remember where it said that, that, that the seraphim took the, the tongs and took a coal from the altar? When the Old Testament, you know what the altar was? The altar was the place to where they burnt offerings. And, and they would take animals. You would have lambs, um, goats, bullets, whatever the case might be. And they would take those, those, those things and they would cut them and, and they would burn them. And it would be an offering. It would be a sacrifice. And that would be on the altar. So, so the seraphim takes the coal and he puts it on Isaiah's lips, and he forgives him. Well, this is a symbol of what Jesus done for us on the altar, on the sacrifice. And except, here's the difference. We didn't get forgiven because of, because of an animal, because of a goat or a bullock or a lamb that, 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 that isn't perfect. We got complete forgiveness from Jesus who was perfect and is perfect. We got forgiveness from the one who did shed his blood for us that was blameless and never sinned at all, who was perfect and upright in every way, who was righteous, who was holy, who was magnificent and awesome. And through his blood, it's like he touched the places on us that needed forgiveness, and he washed us white as snow. And that's the, that's the example that Isaiah is, is, is kind of coming across here with, even though it's the Old Testament, he's using this as an example to show us that, that the altar that which Jesus came from makes us clean, makes us holy. He won't, he won't leave you in the condition that you're in. Here's the cool thing. When you have an encounter with God, He reveals Himself to you. He won't leave you like He found you. Aren't you glad He won't leave you that way? He may find you in sin, but He won't leave you in sin. He may find you in a struggle, but He won't leave you in a struggle. He'll help you get through it. He'll help you get through it. Sometimes we can never forget our... We can never get our purpose in life until we get rid of our past and quit settling for what we were and the person that we used to be. We have to deal with our past so we can step into our future. Sometimes it's not a bad thing to see where God's brought you from. Sometimes it's a great thing to reminisce on because you realize the person that you used to be, you're not even close to that person at all now. It's a good thing to do sometimes is to look back at what you used to be. Sometimes you have to face your past to walk into your future. You have to do that. Sometimes you have to know that. That doesn't mean that it defines who you are at all. Now, um, I'm going to show you one more thing. You begin to play. So, God revealed himself to Isaiah. Don't lose me. Come on. Don't lose me. Every time Paul gets up, everybody starts looking at their phone or looking at their watch and looking at what time it is. And I'm like, I'm still preaching. So look up here. That's what I want you to do. Just look up here. Okay. I'm almost done. I'm just about to. I promise. 35, 40 more minutes, I'll be finished. Would you stay that long? 
Don't lie to me. Don't lie to me. I love you. All right. Watch this. So, watch this. So, what happens? Isaiah gets God to reveal himself. Then God touches Isaiah. And the third thing is God uses Isaiah. Watch. Verse 8. Same chapter. Verse uh, chapter 6. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. There's a big difference. Isn't there a big difference just a couple verses before when Isaiah saw God and how awesome God was? And he said, Woe is me. I'm ruined. I'm nothing. I'm, I can't do anything. But after he was touched, he realized that he could be used. After you've had an encounter and God touches you, you realize that God can use you. And so you say to God, use me, send me, call me, do whatever you want to do because you gave me an encounter with you that I cannot ignore. When God gives you an encounter, you can't ignore that. As they said, oh Lord, send me. Here am I. Send me. You know what I find that it's one of the biggest struggles of the Christian church today? Is that nobody feels like that they have a calling except the people who are on the stage or teaching the class. People tend to evaluate themselves based on their platform. Do you realize that when you walk out the door in the mornings and go with it, do whatever you're going to do and you step foot in your car, and you ride down the road, you're on a platform. How you respond to traffic, how, how, how you look at other people when they cut you off, because it's going to happen. How you respond when you go to Walmart and, and the lines are backed up all the way up the aisle because I've got three registered open. How you respond to people when, when, when they look at you funny and how, they, how you respond to people in your family when they call you names and how you respond to people when they accuse you and how you respond to people when they don't treat you right. And, and, and that's all a platform. You realize that. You're on a platform wherever you're at. You don't need this stage. You don't need this. You have a platform. You say, well, I can't be used. You don't understand. I feel like Isaiah. I feel like I say I'm a man of unclean. I'm a woman of unclean. Well, at least you admitted it. Now you've started. So what about encountering God so that He can take a, a piece of the sacrifice and put it on that part of you that needs to change? And let Him change you. You don't have to stay like you are. You say, well, I've battled this thing for a long time now. I've dealt with this thing a long time now. It's just who I am. No, it's not. That's a lie from Satan. That's not who you are. Don't let that define who you are and who you become. Because all it takes is one encounter. And he can rid you of that. God wants to reveal himself and touch you and use you. My last scripture I want to show you is 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. One of my favorite passages in the Bible. It says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all troubles so that we can comfort. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He does something for us so that we can do something for someone else. Watch he said, He comforts us in trouble so that we can comfort those in any trouble. With the comfort we ourselves receive from God. It sounds like that, wait a minute, that God will give us an encounter with Him to reveal Himself and then touch us in an area that we're struggling with so that we can tell somebody else how God touched us so that, that we can lead them to have an encounter with God in the same. If, if you're in the middle of a battle and God's allowed that battle to continue on, maybe it's for the reason that maybe God wants you to continue to fight 
because of who you're going to have to fight with and for later. Maybe your struggle is for you, but maybe it's going to be for someone else later. Maybe God's going to comfort you in a way that's, that's specifically just for you, but it's going to help you comfort someone else in the way that He comforted you. It doesn't mean that you're God, but you are His hands and His feet. It does mean that you use your platform to show others His love. Maybe there's somebody at your job that needs to feel something that you felt years ago. You know? Maybe it's somebody in your family that needs to feel what you felt. Don't ignore that. Don't ignore that. I think the saddest thing we can ever do is wash our hands of a situation. Because sometimes washing our hands of a situation doesn't mean that God wanted us to do that. We're just fed up with it. I mean, you know, Paul did pray three times that a fool would be taken from him, and God never took it. He just said, my grace is sufficient. Maybe you're throwing it for you. Maybe it's for somebody else. And maybe the reason you're going through what you're going through and you're overlooking this because, because our human nature overlooks the spiritual side sometimes. Maybe you're like Moses and you see a burning bush and you're walking right past it. And God says, I'm in the bush. What you're walking past is what I want you to look at. Because remember, out of the bush came Moses' name. Moses. You know why? Because Moses went to the bush. There might be a trial or a situation that you're walking past that God wants you to walk towards. And if you keep walking past it, it's never going to get dealt with. And the encounter that God wants to give you will never happen. The encounter that God wants you to, to, to help somebody else with It'll never happen. Because you keep walking past the same thing he's calling out of. The flesh side of us thinks differently than the spiritual side. We gotta tune into the spirit. We gotta we gotta tune into what's going on around us. Why are you going through what you're going through? Tell me, Pastor. Why am I facing this? Tell me. Tell me. I want to know. You ready for my answer? I don't have it. But I can give you a truth. My answer won't be what you want to hear, but it'll be your truth. And the truth is that you shouldn't be asking other people what your answer is. And you should be asking the one who can give the answer and give the direction. And that's the one that knows how it's going to end before it started. That's the truth. So quit seeking it from everybody else. It's not going to work. One more thing, let me tell you this. You know, one of the worst things that I feel happens to me is when I go and try to get an answer from someone and I feel like they're as clueless as I am. And I have to search myself. Because then I wonder, well, how am I going to get it? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all the things will work out. They give you what you need. You need an encounter. And you need one so deep that it changes who you are. And it changes the direction that you walk. We spend too much time looking at each other. I don't know anywhere in the scripture where it said for us to search each other's heart. It said for God to search us. And if we spend less time looking at each other, and maybe more time looking at ourselves, maybe we would have the encounter that could change someone else. So what about quit looking at each other? Quit looking at the family, quit looking at the friend, quit looking at the church person and the person at the job, and look at you. Just focus on who you are. And let God encounter you so that you can do something for someone else. Come on, stand with me today. Bow your
here to with me today. Just close your eyes, think about God, don't think about nobody else. Don't allow your mind to wander. That's often all the tricks that happens. I'm very serious about God wants to take us to a different place with Him. Young and old alike. Okay, how young you are, how old you are. You have your own platform. He wants to give you an encounter that He reveals Himself, touches you, and uses you. But my question is what's getting in the way? That's the key. That's the ticket. What's getting in the way of the encounter? Is it your pride? Is it is it yourself as far as how you think or how you feel? Or is it another person? Well, I can't worship the church because somebody else will worship them because they're bigger than God. So what what is that deep that thing that 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 thing that could cause your encounter to not happen? What, what is it? What is it? Because whatever it is could be keeping you from your destiny in life. What is it? What is it? My call on this last week of this series is real simple. If you need to have an encounter with God today, I want you to come and join the one that's came. If you need that, that's 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 simple. That's the altar call. If you need it, find yourself. I'm not praying for nobody. I don't want nobody praying for anybody today. Nothing. Because I don't want nobody feeling like they need prayer for somebody else because that's not going to be an encounter with God. Don't do it. If you want an encounter with God, then you come down here and you pray yourself. Because I can't give you an encounter. Nobody else can either. So if you need it, then you come and seek that. And if you need prayer, tell me and I'll pray with you. But I'm not, I, I, I don't want to interrupt what you're saying to God. You don't need to hear my words. Nobody else is just hear God's. Okay? They're going to sing the altars open. If you need to come, I don't know why you would wait. Lift up some hands to him this morning. I want you to have an encounter with him before we leave in your worship, in your prayer. Now do it your way. I say that I want you to do it your way because I don't want you to feel like there's a certain way you got to do it. Just keep praying. I'm not. Don't even pay no attention to me. Lord, we desire and hunger for you. We seek you. We long for your presence in our life. You give us an encounter. To change who we are. Not to just feel something, but to change us. What is my desire and my prayer? That this church would be a church full of hungry people, passionate people that want you more than anything else. That we would want you more than, than we want pleasure, more than we want success, more than we want to be known. That our reward would be knowing you. As we get closer to you, you get closer to us. As we get closer to you, we begin to think like you and act like you and look like you. 
We should desire to be like you. Give us a new job. Give us a new job. We need a new job. So I want to squash something before you leave a little confused. You're never going to be perfect. I want to clear that. You're never going to be perfect. But there are certain things in your life that God wants to remove because they're hindering your relationship with Him. Okay? So it's not perfection that you're going to ever achieve, but it's a point in your life to where you realize that you don't have a habit or something that's holding you back, a grudge or a bitterness or something that's keeping you from God. You're going to mess up. But all you need is another encounter. God will give, give you what you need. God, we thank you for that today. That you'll never leave us lost and undone. But you will take a piece of the sacrifice, which was Jesus, and place it on us. To forgive us. I'm going to tell you a couple of things. I'm going to let you go. You keep praying. Don't pay me no attention. I'm going to challenge you to give today out of your heart. I'm going to challenge you to give in, in, in tithe and offering today from obedience and not just out of. Because you always do. God really checked me, and something He checked me this week was that if we don't give back to Him, He will keep things from us that He wants to give to us. And so I'm going to encourage you today to worship in your giving. And let God bless your finances. So I want you to pray. I'm going to pray for everyone as we're going to just be dismissed. And I want you to pray about what God would have you to give today. It's just been laid on my heart. God wants to bless somebody abundantly for your giving if you'll give today. I don't ever do that. So don't think it's coming from me. Thank you. God wants to bless you in your giving, but but you need to search your heart to know that. So I look forward to seeing you Wednesday. I'm going to pray with you, and I want you to search yourself. Ask God what He wants you to give today. Let's pray before we go. Lord, I want to thank you for your presence. I want to thank you for being faithful. I want to thank you that you gave encounters today. There were people that had encounters today that changed their life. Yes, it changed their life. It changed the direction they were walking today. God, I pray for each person that we would have an encounter with you more than just on Sunday. Let us have it daily with you. And Lord, I pray for each person that you would prick their hearts today on what to give in worship and their giving. I pray that you would lay on people's hearts to give back to you. You've laid it on my heart today, heavier than ever before about giving. And I just I, I just hope that it gets through to each person to give today so that you can bless them in their giving before they leave. Let us give with cheerful hearts. 
to you, and you will give back to us. You're touching somebody right now and telling them to give. And they're going to give, and you're going to bless them. You're going to multiply that gift. And I pray that today. Bless us, Father. Use us this week. Use us to do something great for you. Reveal yourself. Touch us. Use us. Strengthen us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next week.